But hey, we want to say to begin the morning with happy Father's Day. Ladies, you failed just like the nine o'clock did. Women, that is your opportunity to blow your man's head up. Let me hope, not, don't go now, it's too late. You should have had pom-poms in the pocket. You should have had air horns. You should have had confetti, those whatever, poof, those things. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Praise God. Y'all, well, that's still pretty weak, but we'll go with it. Hey, and happy Father's Day to, to those who are still um, at home this morning watching us online. We want to thank you for, for being a part of what God is doing here at Chestnut Mountain Church. So thank you for continuing to stay connected um, until you feel safe and ready to come back. Um, we just want to say we do miss you. But church, I want you to hear my heart right now. I know last week was a little different. It was kind of the first time the doors were open. And so I prayed that kind of the emotions would stay kind of at bay and that we would be able to kind of make it through the day. But today's kind of a different story because I realized today how much I love you and how much I've missed you. And so church, know that you are loved. Know that you have been prayed for. And I'm so thankful that we get the opportunity to be back in God's house together. I hate cameras. Y'all figured that out right quick, right? But you know, I know when we talk about Father's Day, what's interesting is how when we can say the word Father's Day, that it, it stirs so many, so many different emotions in all of us. Maybe today you are truly here with your father or you've invited your father to come and celebrate him today. Maybe you're a dad here and you've, you've come to celebrate you today. Maybe you're a first time father. Maybe this is your first Father's Day. You know what? I can pick you out in the lineup just as quick as it is. You walk in with your chest all bowed out and you're like, yeah, I'm a daddy now. Today's about me. Uh -huh, right? But I'll tell you this right now. If you don't have a baby, if you're not expecting a baby, don't drink from the water fountains here. Okay, there's something going on and it happens when, you, when you're here for any time, short amount of time. It's like every time we turn around, somebody else is having a baby. And so I think me and Chelsea are sleeping on opposite ends of the houses right now because, yeah, I can't, we no. Are you embarrassed, Chelsea? Yeah, she is. Now when I call her that, she turns even redder. What'd you say, Deacon? Okay, anyway. But, you know, maybe Father's Day stirs in you. Maybe it's sadness. Maybe for whatever reason that, that you're sad because maybe your father's not here. Maybe you didn't have the relationship with your father that you wanted. Maybe it just strikes anger in you. Or maybe you can even think about it and you, you don't really, when we say Father's Day, you don't really think about your earthly biological father. You think about some father figure that God blessed you with, that God put in your life that you can be thankful for because they exemplified what fatherhood should be. But you know, the thing is, is it doesn't matter what emotions you carried in here about a father this morning. What we learn is as we grow older, our idea, our perspective, and, and even our, our reflection on our father, it evolves over the years. I found this and it is so true. And I want you to see how closely you can relate to this. Four years old, at the ages of four, my daddy can do anything. At the ages of seven, my dad knows a lot, a whole lot. Eight years old, my father doesn't quite know everything. At 12 years old, oh well, naturally, fathers don't know anything. 14, father, hopelessly old-fashioned. 21 years old, oh, <laughs> that man is out of date. What did you expect? 25 years old, he knows a little bit about it, but not too much. Age 30, I must find out what dad thinks about it. Verse 30, or verse 35. Y'all hear how spiritual I am, don't you? <laughs> uh, age 35, a little patience. Let's get dad's meaning first. At the age of 50, what would dad have thought about it? At the age of 60, my dad knew literally everything. At the age 65, I wish I could talk it over with dad one more time. You know, what's interesting about that is we see how that evolves. What you see is that it began with dad's influence and it ended with dad's influence. So we see where we go through a season of, of time where we don't think our dads know a whole lot. What we understand is that maybe you're here today and you're a dad or, or maybe you're here today and you don't have biological children, but God has given you a, a platform of fatherhood. I want you to understand this, that it all begins and ends with your influence. 
They may go through seasons where they don't think of it that way, but it begins and ends with your influence. Now, I know some of you are going right now, you're saying, well, you know what? I'm not a father. I'm even a female. So today doesn't really apply to me. Wrong. Because as a follower of Christ, here's what I want you to hear. If you are a blood-bought believer of Jesus Christ this morning, you have a circle of influence. You are impacting people whether you think you are or not. You have influence where God has placed you. Somebody, somewhere is following you. Now, you know, I, I know that as we were getting ready to, to talk to fa- about Father's Day today, um, I had several people, because if, if this is your first time here, we've been reading through the book of 1 Corinthians now for literally for 11 or 12 weeks. And, you know, I, I in my mind, in my, all of my faith that I have, I was asked the question, hey, are we going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this week? I said, well, no, probably not, because I'm going to have to come up with some Father's Day message. Who am I to think God's not going to meet us right where we are again? Because if you've been following for any time, we've seen that every single week that we have opened the book of 1 Corinthians, that God has met us right where we are. You would think that God's kind of in control and knows what he's doing, wouldn't you? Well, kind of the same thing goes this week. You know, now I want you to remember before we look into 1 Corinthians chapter 11, see if y'all followed the cue. Y'all didn't either. As we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I was just wanting to see if you could learn to do it on your own without me having to say, okay, take out your Bibles and turn. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 today, all right? But now remember when the, book, when the Bible was written, it was not recorded with chapter and verses. That was something that man added later to help us better reference, to help us better see things so we could better understand what we were reading and where we were reading from. And so the, if you look at chapter 11, verse one, the placement of this verse is a little bit strange because in the context of what we're reading, it actually is the bookend to chapter 10, okay? So I want you to look with me and you'll understand better in just a minute why. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse one, look what Paul says here. Be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. Be imitators of me as I am also of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a bold, bold, bold statement. But what we understand is that what Paul is addressing here is this is, like I said, the bookend in chapter 10, but he's talking about what he's, he's ending up, what he's been talking about in chapters 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. We've been talking about last week about our freedoms that we have in Christ, but also our responsibility as being a follower of Christ. And so Paul is kind of putting the exclamation point on that. He says, now, look, I want you to understand. Yes, you have freedom in Christ to live however you want to live, but you also have a responsibility as a follower of Christ to reach other people. And so he says, now I want you to imitate me because I imitate Christ. Now, if you're like me, I begin to look at that. and I was like, well, God, come on. Paul for Father's Day? He ain't no father. He ain't, well, we don't really know that he's a father. He could have been when he was Saul, but that's a whole nother story. But Paul was not married. And so we know that he didn't necessarily have a biological children that he could disciple and lead. So why in the world would we look at Paul on Father's Day? I want you to flip back with me to chapter four. Chapter four, and this is very, very interesting how God sort of places this. Because what he's doing in chapter four is he's establishing his relationship with with these new believers in the church at Corinth. And so what we see in chapter four, verses 14 through 16, again, this is the very end where Paul has just talked about being a servant of Christ and also being stewards with what God has given you. God has given us all something that he wants us to use for his glory. So he's just finished addressing being a servant and being a steward. And then look at what he says and how he kind of ends that conversation in verse 14 of chapter four. Paul says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, Yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Then verse 16, you're gonna hear something very similar to what we read earlier. Therefore, I exhort you, be 
imitators of me. Be imitators of me. And so what we see is Paul is establishing his relationship with the church at Corinth. And what we understand about that, what I love is how he calls them. He said, I admonish you as my children, meaning that I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to teach you how to live as a follower of Christ the same way as if you were my child. Now you think in your mind, well, what gives him the liberty to do that? What gives him the liberty to say, I'm gonna be your father figure. What I love about this is Paul is taking full responsibility for their newfound faith in Christ. Because what we see is that Paul was the one that, the first one that had presented the gospel to them, the first one who had told them about the love of Jesus Christ. And we know that by the drawing of the Holy Spirit and the gospel being preached by Paul, they were born again. They had stepped into this new birth of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so what Paul is saying, he says, look, I'm going to be responsible for your birth. I'm going to be responsible for you being born again because I'm the one that shared the truth of God's word with you. The Holy Spirit led you and the Lord saved you. So I'm going to be your father. So I want you to imitate me. Now he says, I want you to imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now understand, that sounds like a very conceited and a cocky statement. Follow me, right? But what we gotta understand is that Paul is not wanting this new church or the, the believers in Corinth to imitate him per se, but as Paul is imitating Christ, he wants them ultimately to be imitating him. So he says, I want you to watch me because I'm trying to live my life in pursuit of Christ. And so the characteristics that I want you to duplicate are not the characteristics of me, but I want you to duplicate the characteristics of who Christ was. So be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Does that make sense? But it's still a bold statement. Still a very bold statement. But what I love about Paul is he's always quick to give credit where credit is due. And he, he even mentions, he says that you have countless tutors in Christ. Meaning what he's talking about is he said, look, although I am your father, I am the one who is responsible to make you and mold you into being a disciple. I'm also aware that you've got a lot of other positive influences around you. You've got a lot of other people around you that are speaking truth, that are teaching you, that are discipling you. But as your daddy, as your father, my voice should be the loudest. Now you think about your life growing up. You think about your child's life now. You, you look around them and you see of all of the tutors in Christ, if you would, that God has placed around them. You know, maybe they're, maybe they're teachers. Maybe they're coaches. Maybe they're amazing student pastors. Those things are great. Those things are awesome. But what I want you to understand is the very thing that Paul is talking about. He said, while all those are great, all those are amazing. But what we as fathers, what we as dads must understand that we must be the predominant voice in our ring of influence. It is our responsibility, not everybody else's. They are coming alongside of us to help us to supplement that in the disciple making of your children. But daddies, hear me when I say this, it's not a youth pastor's job. It's not my job. It is your job to bring your child up in the way that they should go. We're just here to hold your hand along the way. I've got people around me that hold my hand along the way, but our voice must be the loudest. Now, look, I know we're talking about all this positive influence talking about all these positive people that have been placed in your child's life or maybe that were placed in your life, we would be fools not to recognize that while there's positive influences, there's a lot of negative influence. And so not only in taking our responsibility of having the loudest voice among all the positive influences, men, we better man up and step up because we also better be louder than the bad influences in your child's life. It is our responsibility to be the loudest voice. And Paul got this. He said, Ian, I know I'm supposed to be the loudest voice. Some of you dads, you're going right now. Thank you for challenging me with this because you know what? I am definitely the loudest voice in my home. You ought to hear me scream at my kids. Hey, I've got this one down. But I'm not talking about the loudest audible voice per se. 
I'm not talking about how loud your voice can be risen. That's not what we're looking at. But your example and your lifestyle and your livelihood should be the loudest example in your child's life. It's you they are watching. It's you they are mimicking. And so, church, here's what we gotta be. All believers, all followers of Christ, we've gotta be the loudest example in our circle of influence. We've got to be the loudest voice in our circle of influence. And Paul got it because here's where Paul says, chapter four, verse 16, he says, hey, imitate me. Then he repeats it again in chapter 11, verse one, imitate me because I'm going to be the loudest voice. I'm going to be the most influential voice in your life. Now look, right now in our world, that we're living in a, a world of absolute chaos. There's a lot of influences. There's the influence of social media. There's the influence of the news media. There's the influence of friends. There's the influence of coaches. But then there's your voice. And so God, I ask you the question, which one of those voices is the loudest? Which life is the loudest in your child's life? Is it social media? Is it the news media? Is it the friends? Is it the coaches? Because the truth is, is when you look in all of those areas, you can look on social media, you can look at the news, you can listen to friends, you can listen to that, this, you can listen to that. But what we must understand is there's a lot of people responding in a whole lot of different ways. People are responding in their own way to COVID-19. People are responding to, in their own way to racism. People are responding in their own way to hatred. People are responding in so many different ways. But here's the question. How is your response to all of the chaos influencing your child? How is your response to all of the chaos, how is that influencing your child? Because remember, they're watching, they're listening. Not only that, they're imitating us. They're imitating us right now where we're at. Have you ever noticed that, that most children that a lot of times and specifically talking to the dads here, when that child looks at you and says, hey dad, or hey daddy, watch this. Hey daddy, watch this. It's always interesting how things flip again. They evolve right quick because I know used to when I would ask my dad or my mom, hey, mom, dad, watch this. And they would say, now be careful. I'm like, oh, shut up. I'm good. But now guess what? When they tell me, hey, daddy, watch this. I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Have you thought this whole thing through? You know, if you land the wrong way, you're breaking your neck. You know, if you land the wrong way, you're breaking your arm. And I'm doing this whole thing in my mind while they don't even care. Cooper, my little third, or how old is Cooper? 11. I get him and Brock mixed up. When you have like half a dozen, you forget who's who. And there goes Deacon. And anyway, so I looked the other day and Cooper goes, hey, daddy, watch this. So he takes off running at a playground set and hits one foot on this board and then turns a backflip. Had I known he was gonna do that, I would have spanked him before he ever started. <laughs> but it was, hey, daddy, watch this. But do you know what happens most of the time? When a child comes to us and says, hey, daddy, watch this. You know what 90% of the time they're doing? They're about to imitate and try to do something that they've seen you do. No, Cooper has not seen me run up some wall and do a backflip. Okay, maybe 10 years ago, but not now. But when they say, hey, daddy, watch this, they're repeating something that we've done. Whether it's spinning a basketball on your finger, whether it's swinging a golf club, whether it's fixing something or maybe it's casting a fishing rod or maybe it's solving a problem, but their deep down desire that they are naturally born with is to imitate you. And what they wanna say is, Daddy, watch this because I want to do what you're doing. I had a conversation in my driveway this week with, with a member of our church and he began to tell me and we began to talk about Father's Day. 
And he began to tell me of a story where um, they were, him and his son were looking for golf balls. So obviously he has not done a very good job teaching him how to swing the golf club. <laughs> anyway, I just had to put that one in there. I don't even know. I don't even own golf clubs, so I'm not even, anyway. So as they're walking through the woods, he's telling his son, he was helping him navigate through the woods, helping him navigate through the bushes and through the briars for his safety so he didn't, so he didn't get hurt. And then not even prompted, the son says this, and I quote, Daddy, I know how to walk because I'm watching you. I learn how to do things when I see you do them. And in that moment, um, I knew exactly where God was going to be taking us this morning was to simply remind you as a father of your influence. Because the kids are watching how we're responding. You know, I had a kind of a very similar thing happen to me on Friday. Um, my two boys, they quarantine has been the greatest thing that has ever happened to me because I cut yards on Friday. So I have about 10 people that I take care of cutting their grass and I inherited two new employees this summer, one the age of 13, one the age of 11. And so our largest yard that we go to, it's got a driveway that's about a mile long, it seems like. And Cooper is 11 and Cooper is the leaf blower. This poor leaf blower is as big as he is. And so you see Cooper every time we're on the way there. Daddy, I dread going to this yard. It takes me forever. And so... You know, last week, or let me go back two Fridays ago, you know, time is money, right? So you got to get in, you got to get out. We got to get this done thing done as quick as we possibly can. So we get all of the mowers loaded up, everything, we're ready to go. And all of a sudden, Cooper ain't nowhere to be found. So I go wandering around and here's this little 11 year old. And so, you know, very politely, I walked over there to my son. And I said, hey, buddy, why don't you give me the leaf blower? I'm just kidding. I didn't. I said, Cooper, hurry up. We've got to go. And I jerked it off his back and I took over and we finished that sucker in about five minutes. We jump in the truck and left. I really didn't think anything else of it. Now fast forward to this past Friday. We get in the truck and I noticed, I was like, man, that was like record time. And so we get back in the truck and I said, boys, y'all did good today. And Cooper looked at me and he says, daddy, I figured out how to blow better because I watched you last week. And while that's funny, while that's comical, I want you to hear how impactful that is. I had no idea that he was, yes, he was watching me blow the leaves, but what he was doing was he was getting ready to imitate me. He was getting ready to do exactly what daddy was doing and how daddy did it. And so my question that I wanna ask you as a father today we talked about the responses to all the chaos. What if your child looks at you when they go home today and they say, hey, daddy, watch this. But what they're about to attempt to do is to respond the way that you've been responding to all of the chaos. What if that little child says, hey, daddy, watch this. And what they're getting ready to imitate is how you have responded to everything that's going on in our world. Maybe you've lashed out in anger. Maybe you've yelled at the TV. Maybe you've voiced your biased opinions. Maybe you've said this or you've said that. The question is, is that something we want our child to be imitating? Because then on the flip side of that, some of you right now are going, Whew. My kids hadn't seen me do any of that. Because you know what? I've kind of been silent through all this. I haven't really said anything. I haven't really responded. I've not talked to my kids. I've not really talked to my wife because I kind of figure, you know, out of sight, out of mind. I don't really have to worry about it. Remember what I said earlier? Your kids are gonna mimic what they see you do. They're gonna imitate what they see you do. And if they see you do nothing, guess what they're gonna do? Nothing. And when they're doing nothing, guess what? There's an enemy who is seeking around like a prowling lion looking for someone to devour. And if they see you doing nothing, guess what the enemy's going to do? He's going to give them something to do. They're going to imitate someone somewhere. 
So you may think that you doing nothing is, is a good thing. But be careful with that. Because there's a world surrounding your child that is waiting to influence them. And if you don't do it, somebody else will. And God has ordained your voice to be the loudest voice in their life. And so, moving forward with that, doing nothing is not how to handle it. Being silent is not how to handle it. And I don't know if you remember, but two weeks ago, I challenged you. I challenged you as a church to go and have a conversation with someone who is hurting. I challenge you to have that conversation with someone that you know is hurting. And so what I want to do this week is challenge you with something else. I want to challenge you to have a conversation with your child. I want to challenge you to talk about all of the chaos that is going on in this world. And look, I wish I could tell you that this was my idea. I wish I could tell you that it was my idea to go and have a conversation with, another, with your child, but that's not it. The reason that I went and had a conversation with my child is it was fruits of me having a conversation with someone who is hurting. I had a conversation with, with a couple who is, who is black and they, we begin to talk about things. And I begin to hear their hurt and I begin to relate with them. I begin to talk with them. And so therefore he challenged me. Brian, have you ever talked to your kids about what's going on? No. So he challenged me. So last Friday, me and Brock and Cooper, we go to cutting grass again. And I knew I had a long stretch, about 45 minutes between yards. And I said, all right, boys. I said, we're going to talk. I said, Brock and Cooper, do y'all understand really what's going on with all of the protesting, with all of the rioting, with all of the, the hatred and everything that's going on? And Cooper goes, yep, racism. Well, Cooper, what's racism? I don't know. <laughs> he had heard it. Somebody had influenced him and let him know what that was. So in that moment, I became convicted because my child is 11 years old and didn't really have a clue as to what's going on. And so for the next 45 minutes, I began to talk to my children, my two boys, about racism. I began to talk to them about justice. I began to talk to them about police officers. I began to talk to them about love. But I also began to talk about this. Because here's the truth, if we're having conversations with our kids about what's going on in the world and we're not talking about the word of God, you better back up because we've missed it. Because as every conversation we have through the eyes of racism, through the eyes of hatred, through the eyes of evil, if we're not combating it with the word of God, it won't stand up. So as we have these conversations, these hard difficult conversations. Make sure that those conversations are being going through the filter of God's breathing, living word. Because this is the only thing that's going to be left standing. It's this one, this truth. Now I know you're hearing me and you're thinking, oh, Brian, you're so super spiritual. You just want the dad of the war to year. You've had all your conversation with your kids and but you know what? Paul says, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ, right? And so what we hear in that is we hear this. I want you to flip with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse, verse 15. Paul is, is, is talking again here. He's leaving another example for us to imitate in him. Look at what Paul says in verses 15 and 16. Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. 
So Paul is challenging us to weep with those who are weeping, to hurt with those who are hurting, to come alongside those who are depressed, to come alongside those who feel rejected. And what we are called as followers of Christ is to imitate Paul. But what we understand is Paul is imitating Christ. And if you read back back in the gospel of John chapter 11, I truly believe this is what he's referencing. Because we all know that chapter 11 is where Lazarus has died. He's one of Jesus' best friends. And we all know, chapter 11, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? Yeah, see, y'all all love memorizing that one. Because if you went to North Hall, we know we got to find them two-word verses. I can memorize. Those are easy. But as we hear that, he says, Jesus wept. And so many people say, and they do things, and they talk about, well, of course Jesus wept. He just lost his best friend. But in the sovereignty of God, you understand, Jesus knew what was about to happen. He knew that he was about to speak and say, Lazarus, come forth. He knew that Jesus was about, he knew that he was about to resurrect Lazarus from the dead. So really, why in the world, hey, Deacon, so why in the world would he be crying because he knows that Lazarus is about to come back to life? So what we see is we see that Jesus is about to weep with those who weep. He's about to mourn with those who mourn because you see also was Mary and Martha. They were there. And as they sat there weeping, I believe with everything in me that the reason that Jesus was weeping is because he hated seeing his loved ones hurt. He hated seeing his loved ones cry. He hated seeing his loved ones walk through something that they had no idea how to deal with. They're walking through the death of Lazarus and Jesus was brokenhearted because they were brokenhearted. And in that, he was getting to live out what we're going to read later in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says that when one member of the body of Christ hurts, the entire body hurts. And so as we as followers of Christ, as we see our body, the big C church hurting. Church, let me encourage you. We need to be hurting with everyone. We need to be hurting with all of those who are hurting. We need to be walking with all of those who feel rejected. And because we're never more like Christ than when we're weeping with those who weep and we're coming alongside those who are depressed. And so church, it's time that we stand up and we imitate Christ. And by that, we're imitating what Paul had done. And so now back to that whole thing where I sounded real spiritual a minute ago. Man, I had a tough conversation with my kids. I had to ask myself the question, have my children seen me hurt? Have my boys watched me weep with those who are weeping? Have my boys watched me come alongside those who are lowly, who are depressed, who feel beat down, Have my boys seen me shed tears over the state of our nation? Have my boys seen me shed tears over the state of the church, the big C church? Have they seen a daddy fall on his knees and cry out to God to heal our land? Have they seen daddy fall on his knees and pray for those who are hurting? Has he seen me fall? Have they seen me fall on my knees and weep for those who are weeping? And the answer to that question is nope. They hadn't. And so for that, that's a part of daddy that I don't want him to imitate. As a father, I need to be teaching my children that right now, the best thing we can do as a follower of Christ is take a stand and that stand is on our knees. That stand is falling on our knees and saying, God, we want to see a victory, but we're having to trust you that you're the only one that is going to see us through. So my children have not seen that, but they're watching. They're imitating me. But you see, the truth is, is I want them to be a better example for their children than I have been for them. So dads, and we'll expand that so the dads don't feel completely beat up today. 
believers today, I want you to examine your influence. I want you to examine your influence. What do we want to see our kids imitate? Do we want to see them imitate us doing nothing? Or do we want to see them imitate us by standing on the truth? And that truth is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, church, remember, dads, we are to be the loudest voice in our child's life. And that loud voice is going to have to back up some tough conversations. Some awkward conversations. I found a quote this week and it says this. It says, your, child, your kids will talk to you about things that you will talk to them about. Your kids won't talk to you about things you don't talk to them about. So if we'll talk to them, guess what? They'll talk. They'll talk. Is your voice the loudest one? Or you're teaching your kids how to pray? Are you teaching your kids how to weep with those who weep? Are you teaching your children how to mourn with those who mourn? They're imitating us. They're imitating the good and the bad. And it's amazing how much God has taught me this summer cutting grass. <laughs> See how spiritual I am, don't you? But you know, obviously with the two boys, Brock is 13 and Cooper's 11. And obviously they don't know a lot about cutting grass. So we've had to teach them how to use a weed eater, how to use an edger, how to use a blower. And I can go back and I can look at the job they've done and I can look over there and see how they're doing it. And what is so scary is the way that I respond to the way they're doing it a lot of times. I wish I could say that I run over there to their rescue and say, hey, look, buddy, here's how you weed eat better. You do it like this and you show them so gentle. But you know how I do it? What are you doing? You're making a mess. Look how terrible this is. We're gonna lose this yard and it's because of you. That's pretty rough, ain't it? Y'all are going, oh my gosh, he really, yeah. But here's the scary part. Just a few days back, we were cutting grass and Cooper doesn't like to weedy very much so, because he doesn't know how. So as I'm on the lawnmower, the lazy guy, and you know, just that's pretty good. I look over and it almost brought tears to my eyes because I saw Brock hand Cooper the weed eater. And I saw Cooper begin to try to weed eat. And he began to, to move it back and forth the way that he was supposed to. And then all of a sudden I saw Cooper mess up. And you know what Brock did? He imitated me. He began to lash out at Cooper. He began to fuss at Cooper. And so I went from tears of joy to tears of brokenness. Cause you gotta understand all my little boy was doing was imitating what he saw daddy do. And I wish I could say that that was a good thing then, but it wasn't. So as a believer, know that people are watching. Notice that, be aware that they're going to imitate what they see you doing, whatever influence God has given you. And I know dads today, <laughs> you're walking out of here going, oh my gosh. And it can seem like the most discouraging message that you've heard because maybe you're like me and you've seen all of the areas of my life that I don't want my children to imitate. But what I wanna challenge you to do right now in this moment 
If you'll go ahead and stand to your feet. Just as it was earlier, this altar is still open. But maybe as a mom, maybe as a wife, whatever that may be, maybe it's as a child. Maybe right now for this response, you bring daddy to this altar and you begin to pray over daddy. You begin to lift his name, his name to the Lord. Because can I tell you right now, there's nothing as a father that can be more honoring than a spouse or a child taking the name of that daddy to the Lord. And so maybe this morning, that's how you respond. May you bring your husband to the altar. Kids, maybe you grab daddy by the hand and maybe you come and you pray over them and you lift them up. You pray that they have strength. You pray that they have courage to lead them, to lead me the way that God has called them to lead you. Don't let today pass by. Don't miss an opportunity today to pray for that person that God has placed in your life to influence you. Don't miss this moment. You know, my dad's been gone for about seven years now. Do you know what I'd do to take him by the hand and bring him here? Do you know what I'd do to grab him by the hand and bring him and pray over him? Not to point out everything that he's done wrong, but to clear up everything that I did wrong and say, Daddy, I'm sorry. And I can guarantee you this, I know my dad well enough to know he would have never been more honored in all of his life had I took the initiative to do it. So what does that look like for you this morning, church? Who is it that you need to honor today? Hey, daddy, watch this. Remember, they're imitating you. God, I pray that right now that we would be sensitive to your spirit. Lord, I pray that that there's a dad in this place right now that feels beat up, that feels down, that feels depressed, that feels like they have been a failure. God, I pray that you would prompt by your Holy Spirit in that spouse's heart, in that child's heart, to grab that daddy by the hand and bring them to an altar just like this and honor them by praying that, God, you would give them strength to be the man that you've called them to be. So God, let us move this morning in response to what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.